How you doing, people? Welcome back to another ESO video. Today is a massive deep dive into the Sorcerer class for the Elder Scrolls Online. The Sorcerer class can play every single role in the game, just like every class can, but how do you do it? Well, I'm going to go over the do's and the don'ts, the how's and the why's, and I'm going to show you what you can do to make a very powerful Sorcerer character just by utilizing their skills. But to go further more into that, obviously, if you stay towards the end of the video, you're going to see some recommendations about what you could use to keep up with your class identity, regardless of which role you choose. So let's go into the details, shall we? What is the Sorcerer all about? Well, the Sorcerer is about lightning and physical damage overall. Yes, of course, you can heal and you can survive. You've got healy rolls and tanky rolls. But when it comes to damage output or even skills that just apply any damage, even if it's a defensive one, they generally work towards lightning and physical. Then they do have magic in there as well, which is an element of sorts. But we'll go over that once we get into these skills specifically. Now, when you first pick up the Sorcerer, you will notice that you've got three individual class skill lines. Every single class does, and they usually, a bit more often than not, are kind of separated into damage, healy, and tanky stuff. Now, with the beginning of the game, the base game classes, in fact, that was not completely solid, whereas some of the newer ones, you'll see that there is a difference. Like the Arcanist and the Warden and the Necromancer is a little bit more even, but the base game classes, the Sorcerer, the Nightblade, the Dragon Knight, and of course, the Templar, they do cross over a little bit. First of all is the dark magic skill line. Now, before you go into this and before you start looking into which skills you should and shouldn't take for your build, understand that these three skill lines level up independently. Each skill line requires one skill at least to be on your bar when you gain XP. So if you're on a one bar build, that's easy. Slot one of these skills. Every kill or every XP benefit that you gain will enhance their skill line level it will upgrade it but if you have a two bar build you need to make sure that the bar that you are currently on is the one that holds the skill basically if you have crystal shards on your back bar right now and you hand in a quest well it doesn't get any experience points the skill doesn't neither does the skill line but if you swap bars and then hand the quest in happy days so you must always maintain a skill from each skill line while you're leveling to gain xp to level the skill line up and when you do that, you will unlock other skills. These all have their own checkpoints and you will have to level up the skill line in order to access the next skill. So first of all, we're going to go into the dark magic skill line, which is mostly magic damage for the damaging skills. And it also has the ability in some of the other skills to control. So you've got immobilizations and stuns. So Crystal Shards is basically a sorcerer um, spammable of sorts. It does magic damage on impact and your next non-ultimate casting ability within the next three seconds will be cheaper. So anything that isn't an ultimate, you get a reduction to cost. And it looks like this. You fire a magical projectile and there you go. Happy days. But again, because you have a benefit to this, you will see in your buff timers, we go to combat and activate all buff timers. Look at the bottom. I know that's intimidating. There's a lot of stuff there. But if we activate this, you'll see on the right hand side of the screen, there is a flashing crystal frag or crystal shard image. That is your timer to let you know that while that is active, your skills are cheaper. So you will see here that for argument's sake, our wall of elements is 2525. Now, if we activate this, it is now 2287. Reduction to cost is there, and then it goes up again. So you've got a window of opportunity to take advantage of some uh, sustainability bonuses. Again, it's our main spammable. You can just activate it over and over and over with light attacks in between and do extra damage, or you can obviously use something else, but you can morph this. You can morph every single skill in the game in two different ways. So version one is crystal weapons. Now, this particular skill now costs stamina and it has a duration, so it lasts six seconds. Convert it to stamina, which causes your next two light or heavy attacks to deal bonus damage and reduce the target's resistances. So it's very different. It now does physical damage instead of magicka. It has a duration and you still keep the last bonus. After casting your next non-ultimate ability within three seconds, your next skills cost less. So, if we activate this now, we've got a buff. And our light attacks, two of them, and our heavies, are stronger. So the trick to this is basically activate it. Look at the bottom right-hand side of the screen, you'll see the actual image of the skill. You can see it's got a timer. While that's active, 
these two are stronger and then it goes away. Or a full heavy and one more, or you can recast it. They'll be stronger. So that's a very different way to play that skill. Instead of firing individual shards, you actually damage the enemy more by taking advantage of your base game mechanics, your lights and your heavies. But it's only two lights or two heavies. Then you have to reactivate it. Now, what I've done here is I've brought a massive amount of respec scrolls so we can show all the morphs. So what we'll do now is we'll morph this to the other style. Now, Crystal Fragments changes from shards to fragments. It still actually fires a projectile, but with a bit of a twist. While it still gives you a reduction to cost for your next skill, while you fire this, you actually kind of generate some RNGesus. If you are lucky, your next Crystal Frag will be a lot cheaper and do a lot more damage based on whatever you fire. So while slotted, casting a non-ultimate ability of any kind, Sorcerer, Weapon Skill Line, Guild Skill Line, doesn't matter where the ability comes from, casting any skill can make this glow in a different color to let you know that you are now about to use the special version of it. So if we activate this, you will see that on the bar, it looks exactly the same as normal. It's blue with a countdown timer on it, obviously because you now have the reduction to cost. So it's on your buff bar and it's there, but now it's pink. See that it's pink or purple? That is your Instacast version. So the skill has a channel. One second. One second. But if you cast magic abilities or stam abilities, anything that isn't an ultimate, it will glow pink and your next one is Instafire. So if you were light attack spamming it, the purple one is quicker and does more damage, but either one of them gives you a reduction to cost for your next skill. So this becomes a very helpful spammable with a little bit of luck on your side, introducing some extra damage and more flow to your rotation. Again, any skill can actually enhance that, not just the skill itself. So it's up to you which one you choose, but one is a stamina costing ability that utilizes your base game free mechanics. The other one is more of a faster paced spammable with more damage. Also one more twist to this, the purple version of it actually costs half. So yes, you can take advantage of the reduction to cost, then get the faster fire and more damage, less costing one, and your rotation becomes much more manageable sustainability wise. So that can be really, really fun, but it depends on you as a player. Remember, this now does magic damage, as does the original morph, but the stamina morph does physical. Next up is Encase. Encase basically starts off as a root. It's an immobilization skill. So you can actually immobilize enemies in front of you for four seconds and they can't move. It's not the same as a stun, because the stun and immobilization are two different cooldowns. Immobilization is a route where they can't move their feet, but they could dodge roll out of it. A stun is a physical stun where they can't do anything. They can still punch you while immobilized, but they just can't move their feet. Now this does also restore Magicka if you fail to immobilize the target. So if they're already CC immune, so they've been immobilized recently or they've been stunned recently, then you can still get your resources back so you don't completely waste the skill. If you use this on an enemy that isn't a target dummy, then instead of just the wavy effect underneath their feet, which is quite hard to see, they would have crystals all around their feet to symbolize the fact or visualize the fact that they are now immobilized. The resource cost is refunded to a certain extent. You get about 66% of it back if you cannot immobilize them. So that's very important to know. Now, the other version of it is a little different. One of them, deals damage when the effect ends. So you basically immobilize the target for four seconds, and then after it's over, even if they try to dodge roll to break out of it, they will do damage to the target. And again, if they can't be immobilized, you get the magic back. So a very similar visual effect, but you do damage from it. The other version, you gain major vitality, increasing your healing received. This also has a, an increased duration for you for the healing received bonus, depending on how many enemies you hit. So every single immobilization per target will be six seconds per target. But if you hit more than one, you will get an extra second for every enemy you had. So two seconds initially, but one second per target. Technically speaking, if you were to go and apply this in a big, big crowded room, you could get up to like seven seconds or so of this bonus. But again, it's capped a maximum of six. You cannot generally apply this unless you actually are in combat. So you can't just fire it and get the, the bonus. But if you are fighting something and you activate it, you'll see on the right hand side there, I've got a healing received bonus. If I show you in the character sheet, 
Major Vitality. Now it says six seconds on the buff timer on the far right hand side, but they count the one second as well, so that's seven. Two initially and one per target up to a maximum of six. So the choice is yours really. Activate one to immobilize and do damage afterwards, which is really helpful in PvP if you want to control people or the other one that gives you a heal and receive bonus. Both of them technically are used for control and generally speaking, it's usually a tank role that would take advantage of it, but it's not restricted to a tank. You can use it when you want. Rune Prison, very different type of uh, crowd control skill. This one imprisons the enemy and stuns them for three seconds and it cannot be blocked. So in PvP, this is very helpful. And in a crowded room, if you're trying to control specific enemies that can be crowd controlled, this will set them down. Now, again, you cannot activate this on a target dummy, generally speaking, because they can't be stunned. So if I activate it here, nothing's going to happen to that target. Here is the morph. The morphs are the most important thing. Initially, it's a stun. It holds the target in place. This one deals damage when the effect completes, and it does magic damage, by the way. And this one casts a spell on yourself, stunning the next enemy that attacks you. It's on you for two whole minutes, and while active, the next enemy that attacks you is imprisoned in a cage themselves for three seconds. So this is completely different to the other morph. This one you can actually stack for extra damage alongside the prison if you do the damage for this one. So again, in PvP, very tactical play there. You could apply an immobilization and a stun, two separate skills, and both of them, when they run out, will do damage. So you turn a target into a bit of a bomb. Again, if you're a tank, I mean, the case is you just want to hold them still, but obviously maybe you don't want to get stunned yourself, PvP or PvE. So you could pre-buff this, for yourself just in case you get in trouble as you can see there is a buff on me now for two whole minutes and anyone that hits me will be stunned in return it's basically a reflect so if you get jumped in pvp or if you've got a couple of small ads that are a bit annoying maybe a strangler or something pre buff this and you're good to go again these two are more tactical play whereas this one is more just flat out damage dark exchange is quite simple costs stamina and for costing you stamina, you return 8,800 health and 3,600 magicka instantly. And then after that period of time, after the initial cast, you will additionally recover 2,400 magicka over 20 seconds. So it's a burst of resources at the cost of another and a recovery bonus on top. And the exchange also grants you minor berserk, which will increase your damage by 5%. You can get that from other sources, yes, but for the sorcerer, you've got it by yourself if you need it. Now, when you change this, this is where you kind of flip it over a little bit. So Dark Deal converts it Magicka into health and stamina instead. So instead of costing stamina, it costs you magic. Instead of getting back magic, you get back stamina. So depending on which way you build, whether it's mostly Magicka or mostly stamina, depends on which one of these you might want to take. And again, you will also get the Stamina Recovery Bonus instead of the Magicka Recovery Bonus if you activate it. One more other thing to, to note, by the way, this does actually grant you Minor Berserk and Minor Force. Minor Force will give you 10% increased critical damage, so you don't need to slot a Beast Trap or anything. So that's actually very, very helpful, and it does last a decent amount of time. You've got 10 seconds out of that. Dark Conversion increases the amount of health you restore. So Dark Exchange in its basic form is now dramatically boosted for your resource sustainability versus extra buff and different resource. So the choice is honestly up to you, but bear in mind this does have a cast time. It takes one second to cast this skill. That's a 17k here, that was pretty big. So if you try to block or if you get interrupted or try to dodge roll or anything, you will cancel the skill. So if you get interrupted or you stop the cast, the skill doesn't apply. If you do the whole cast, then of course you get 20 seconds worth of the skill. Bear in mind, you do need to drop your block in order to cast this, whether it be in a channel or cast time. So unlike some skills where you can block cast, this one you cannot. Very different to the other skills. This one's resource management and a bit of a buff. This one is a stun, but you've got two variants, your basic one or your kind of trap one. This is effectively a trap, it immobilizes targets, and this one does loads and loads of damage. And finally, to keep up with the trap theme of control and stun and immobilize, you have Daedric Mines. Daedric Mines are a trap that you set up yourself. Three mines on the ground, take a while to come up, but those are traps. If any enemies stand inside them, they will be hurt, and they will take magic damage, and they only last 15 seconds, so you don't have long to preempt the trap, but they do take a while to wind up. 
Now, enemies caught inside of this will also be immobilized for two seconds, and enemies can only be damaged by one mine every two seconds. So you could have multiple enemies run into the crowd, and they can all be hit at once, but each individual target can only be hit by a mine once every two seconds to prevent you from overstacking multiples on the same target. If three enemies are here, they can all be hit at the same time. One, two, and three but no target can be hit twice by two different mines within less than two seconds. Now, the morphs for this are both quite different. So one of them, Daedric Tomb, actually instantly applies the mines. So the second they land, they are armed and they can be thrown up to 28 meters. Instead of landing on your feet, you can actually place them at a distance, but they're expensive. So you can now cast them anywhere you want. It takes a little bit to aim them, but you can chuck them into a room and kind of cover a corridor, or you can put them on your feet. It's up to you, but they arm straight away. Bit different. However, the other morph still follows the previous rule of placing them on your feet, but instead you have more. So they still have an arming time. They still take time, but now you've got five. So if you are trying to defend a particular location, you can set this up so anyone that gets in your space is going to be trapped and hurt inside the mines. One morph, more mines. The other morph, instacast and range. Entirely up to you. They do hurt. They are very, very powerful, but they are expensive. So be mindful of your resources. Now we're going to go into the Daedric summoning skill line. So first off, we got a pet. So it starts off as a scamp. Get this little guy out. He will hit people for you. Now, people don't generally understand how to control pets. It's quite simple. They'll hit any target you're hitting, or if there's multiple targets, they'll hit whoever they want. But if I do this and I hit loads of different targets, the scamp will hit what he wants to do. That one. He won't change unless I heavy attack one. Then he will switch targets. As you notice there, I didn't even need to do a full heavy. As soon as I start channeling a heavy, he will change targets and you can fully control him and tell him where to go. That is important to note because otherwise you might accidentally end up pulling bosses. So the scamp is quite helpful as free damage basically that you control with a heavy attack or if it's just one target hit them anyway. But it does come with a bit of a bonus. It does hit with shock damage and once summoned you can activate its special ability. This is its special ability. You buff him and as you can see there on my buff timers, there's a 20 second bonus and he is constantly pulsing. That means that he will constantly pulse in area of effect doing damage to all targets that are close. And as you can see on my buff timers on my main ability bar, you can see when it's going to run out as well as your actual buff timers on the long strip at the bottom. So you've got two different places to note that. Let's run out, reapply it. That's it. And again, even when he's buffed, you can still heavy attack to change targets. Now the other morph of this is completely different. Daedric summoning if it wasn't already obvious, is about pets or summoning skills. This one is basically a stun at the same time as doing damage. So while you do damage over three seconds, the second hit stuns the enemy for three seconds. So he looks the same, he acts the same, he does basically the same damage, give or take, but he can stun people. So again, you've got some control. Now the other morph is not even a scamp, it's a clan fear. Now, the Clan Fear is quite unique uh, in comparison to the other one because it doesn't actually excel at damage. It does do damage, but it doesn't excel at it. And the damage is physical instead of magic or shock. What this does is this helps you survive. The higher your health, the bigger the heal will be, but obviously it's a really large heal for us nonetheless. It will cost you Magicka to activate a special ability, but you'll heal you and the pet. And also, when the pet does its tail swipes, it does damage, obviously, but when it bites, it can actually temporarily taunt the target, much like a chain can. So you can override it with pierce armor or any solid taunt, but it will gain aggression, which is actually quite helpful for solo players, or if you're a tank that's trying to gain control of the room and a few things are running a bit wild. Check this. When he hits stuff, when he bites, look at the debuff timer underneath the target's name and health way at the top there you got the black background with a broken shield it does apply a taunt to people that it bites so if you have to take this dude here he'll go over and bite him same applies he's got a taunt on him so any specific target that the pet is hitting will allow you to maintain aggro on it so as a dps be careful of that but also as a tank that's really helpful especially if you don't have a solid taunt kind of controlled right now. Maybe your resources are a bit low, maybe a heavy attack is needed. Well, he can help you keep hold of the target. Bear in mind, this is a little different to your average taunt. If you do apply it once, it doesn't constantly refresh itself. It works in the same way as a chain. 
So if he bites that target, it won't refresh the taunt. You can see here that he's still biting him, but it won't refresh it. But if he buys another target, it starts a new one. There's a video on my channel regarding the taunt changes as far as chains are concerned. This pet effectively works as a chain. Above all, this will give you a big heal for you and the pet. So one is for damage, the other one is for control and heals. Daedric Curse. This is how you boost your pets. So this particular ability does magic damage to single target, and then after six seconds, it will explode. So very simply put, activate it. After six seconds, bang. That hurts. You can morph this, of course. It's very simple. You can just apply it and leave it run until it explodes, but only one curse at a time, so don't put it on multiple targets. If you morph it, you've got two different versions. This one reduces the cost and your pets deal now an additional amount of damage to only cursed targets. So while it still does damage initially and still does damage after six seconds, any pet attacking this target will do 45% more damage. So if you are a pet build, obviously you want to take advantage of this particular skill to boost their damage on top of their buffs that they may already have from you activating their special ability. If you don't want to use this particular version because maybe you're not using pets, you can still take advantage of the curse because you can use this morph. This one is a little different. So this one adds a second explosion. It can again only be applied to one target. It does damage initially. It explodes after three and a half seconds now instead of six, but then after 8.5 seconds, it will go off again. So the last one was a single pop after six seconds. Watch carefully. Two different countdowns. One and then another countdown for a whole eight and a half seconds. While that is a funky timer, fire and forget when it's finished, reapply it. Now, next up is yet another pet. So you can have two, and this is the winged twilight, and it does damage to individual targets. As you can see here, it will zap lightning over and over and over and over and over. You apply your control exactly the same way as before. However, while this does shock damage, much like the clan fear does, this also has a special ability. Instead of a pulsing AOE that stuns, this will actually heal a friendly target, which is kind of handy. So if you activate it while it's in combat or out of combat, you and the pet get a heal. So you've got a healing pet, which is mostly used for a tanky side of things, or you can just use it for aggro purposes if you want. You've got a clan fear, which will do loads and loads of damage and stun. Then you've got this, which will do constant damage all the time, and it gives you a heal as well. And remember, this is a heal for a friendly target, so you can actually heal someone in your group. But it is random. It does generally work towards the lowest health person, but they have to be in range, 28 meters range specifically. Now, the morphs are slightly different. The matriarch will actually heal up to two targets instead of just one. So that's a lot more effective in a group scenario rather than a solo scenario. And the other morph actually applies a buff to it that increases its damage output making it do 60% more damage to enemies above 50% health. This is like the other version of an execute. Basically, executes are used to do more damage at low health. This is utilized to do more damage at higher health. So you activate it and maintain it. But if it runs out, obviously you want to reapply it, but don't reapply it under 50% health. You just let it do what it does. So you don't actually have to ever activate this if you can't maintain it. I mean, obviously it helps if you do, but it's not the end of the world if you don't. But you don't want to be firing this after 50% health because after it goes lower, that buff no longer applies to that. You will still waste resources. You will still activate it, but it won't affect the target in any way, shape or form. It will just do its basic damage. So to recap over that, Activate it for more damage on that target when the health is high. Don't activate it anymore when the health is low. Now, next up, of course, is Hardened Ward, which is the morph I've got at the moment, but I'm going to change the morph real quick so you can see its basic form. This is your protection skill. Starts off as Conjured Ward, and it's basically a damage shield that scales off of your max health or max magicka. You heard me correctly the first time. It is capped at 55% of your maximum health. So if you have a really, really high health bar, you will scale this shield with that resource. If you have a really, really high magical bar, you will scale this with that resource. So whichever one of the two is higher, that's where its strength comes from. But to make sure it's not too OP, it does have a cap. 
and that is 55% of your current maximum health. So if you have 20k health, it's capped at 55% of that. If you have 50k health, it's capped at 55% of that. The one stat is for its strength, the other is its limiter. All you do is activate it when you're in trouble, and it will coat your health bar. As you can see there, got the purple bar on top of the red bar. If you were to build as a tank, the higher health would benefit the shield. If you were to build as a magicka DPS, the higher magicka bar would benefit the shield. And if you were to build as a stamina sorcerer, the health is going to be your highest stat of the magicka or health. So the shield will scale off of that. Meaning, yes, as a stam sorc, you could utilize this as an active damage shield. The two morphs are actually quite different, although you still benefit from a shield regardless. Regenerative Ward will give you the same bonus damage shield to help you survive, but it's cheaper and it increases the duration of it as well. So you actually have it for 10 seconds instead of six. Bear in mind, normally if you get hit with a damage shield, it's stripped straight away. So the duration is irrelevant. But what you do benefit from is minor intellect and minor endurance, and so does your group. So you and your group actually get a 15% magicka and stamina recovery bonus just for you activating the skill. So it encourages you to use it more often but obviously has a timer. So after 10 seconds, if you want to reapply it, you can, but if you don't, then obviously they lose the buff. Quite helpful to help with resource management for your group if you don't have minor endurance or intellect from somewhere else. However, Hardened Ward, exactly the same application, but much, much stronger. Again, it's still capped and boosted the same way, but instead of 55% of your max health, it's 72. So even as we are now, we are on 30.2K max health as a DPS, which gives us a 16.5k damage shield without considering champion points to boost that. As a tank, if you're around 50-60k health, you're looking at a 20-25k plus damage shield. It is insane. So that is your protective skill. Bound Armor will give you a block mitigation bonus if you activate it. So activating this skill will give you a small bonus for three seconds where if you are holding block at the time that this is active, and yes, you can cast it through block, you will take less damage. It's a block mitigation bonus. It's very, very effective. The higher you level that through the ranks, then of course, the stronger the skill gets. In this sense, it's a block mitigation bonus and timer. Now, while slotted, you also increase your maximum magicka and you gain minor protection at all times. So you can just leave it there to give you that bonus. And of course, you can activate if you need to. If you never end up blocking anything, you don't need to activate it. Just leave it there doing its stuff. Two different variants though very different variants. Bound Aegis still gives you the same 8% max magicka bonus. It still gives you the minor protection. It does give you 40% block mitigation for five seconds rather than 36 for three, but it also gives you minor resolve, which will give you 2974 physical and spell resistance for all the time it is on your bar or your back bar. This carries over. So if it's slotted on any bar, you'll benefit from all of that stuff. Now, if you've got minor resolve in your group or minor protection in your group, obviously they don't stack, but you've got it with you all the time anyway. Bonuses on your bar indefinitely for doing nothing. Activate it for extra block mitigation if you need to. Very, very handy skill. Now, the other variant of it is very, very different. So what you need to do here is you morph it for the other version, which is actually bound armaments. This will, instead of giving you max magicka, give you max stamina. No minor protection, no minor resolve. But what you do is you have a constant bonus on your bar, both bars, so you don't need to double bar or anything. And what you do is you need to activate the skill. Once you've stacked up bonuses towards it. Now this particular morph is very different. This one costs stamina when you activate it. Previously, you had to activate this to start the buff, but no longer do you have to do that. This can be on the back bar or the front bar, and it will give you a constant benefit towards your lights and heavies. Every one light attack, look above my head, there's a dagger. Every heavy attack will give you stacks. A light attack will give you one, a heavy attack will give you two. Look at my buff timers on the right hand side. You can see that there's a count down there, purple buff or a pink buff with a number four in it. If I look at a target, my skill now glows. So four light attacks or two heavy attacks or one heavy and two lights, whatever. As long as you stack up to four, this will max out and then it will glow. Now you can fire it at any time if you have one stack or four, but if you get to four, you'll get the most. And if you activate the skill, you fire four daggers at the target. Light attack, one dagger, heavy attack, 
Two daggers. Couple of heavy attacks. Four daggers. That's a little tricky to track to start with, but if you've got your buff timers shown, then it will be there on the bottom right hand side. They can move around depending on what buffs and bonuses you've got at the time, but that's how you keep an eye on the stacks. Much like the crystal shard morph where you build up lights or heavies and you can fire off extra damage, this is very similar. And yes, of course you can stack the two because they're two different skills. So generally speaking, the Daedric summoning skill line is about summoning things. Summoning pets, summoning curses, shields, and whizzy daggers that you throw through the air. But bear in mind this very important thing. While bound armament, or bound armor, whichever morph you take for this, doesn't need to be double barred, your pets do. Your pets must be double barred, otherwise they will die. Lucky for you, if you're on a one bar build, you only have one bar anyway, so you never swap and they don't die. So first of all, we've got Mage's Fury. This is an execute. Basically, if the enemy goes to around 20% health, you will do more damage. Now, bear in mind when I say around 20% health. So if you are above 20%, it will put a four second timer on the target. If it goes under 20%, then it will pop. However, if it's under 20% already, it will definitely pop and it will do damage and error of effect as well as the extra damage on target. So technically speaking, you want to use this under 20% health to get its full strength. But if you can fire it just before it's about to go down or you can push its health down, then you can obviously get the extra damage out of it. Especially in PvP when someone's sitting around 30% health, put this on early, fire off a light or heavy attack, you might push them under 20% and they're going to die. In PvE, obviously you want to use this as a bit of a spammable execute. In PvP, you might get lucky and just get a kill from one pop. But two morphs. Endless Fury costs less and restore Magicka if the target dies by the damage dealt by this ability. Quite a lot, actually. If an enemy is killed within five seconds of it being hit by it, you get nearly 5k back. The other variant is higher damage, but no resources back. And it looks like this, basically. Lightning down from the sky, hits the target, does damage. Again, if it's low health, under 20%, all targets around will get the pop and it will do more damage on target. Instead of 6k, it'll do a lot, lot more. But the two morphs are both executes. One is cheaper and gives resources back. The other one does more damage. Lightning form is quite simple. You turn into, well, a lightning wizard. You will get major resolve, increasing your physical resistance and spell resistance by 5948. And you will do shock damage in an area of effect every two seconds. Like this. Everyone gets zapped. Now the two morphs to this are quite simple. One is basically the same, except stronger. It increases duration and you get Major Expedition for a brief period after activating it. You're faster. So if you're used to it and you like to have speed buffs at the same time, the initial activation of this will give you a speed buff. It still does damage every two seconds. Happy days. You're faster. So duration and speed. Duration being 30 seconds. That is quite long. So remember, that's your resistance buff and close quarter damage. Not massive damage, but it does benefit nonetheless. The other morph, however, does ramp up as far as damage is concerned. This one is instead a stamina variant of the skill. And it creates kind of a wind around you. This does physical damage instead of magicka, but every stage that it enhances size-wise, it will do more and more damage, increasing the damage up to 120% more than the original, and it will go up to nine meters in size from five. So it gets very, very powerful. It does give you a constant movement speed bonus, not the same as the previous skill, but for the full duration. So Boundless Storms will give you a four second version of Major Expedition. This one will give you a full duration of Minor Expedition. So it's 15% speed instead of 30. But again, one is for a quick burst and a long duration buff. This one is just a constant 20 second speed buff and damage. And this one, again, is stronger. Still does damage and area of effect every two seconds, but it's physical and it grows. Choice is yours, but mind your resources. If you are built for Magicka, obviously you gotta watch your stand bar and vice versa. Lightning Splash is next. This is your ground-based lightning ability. Nice and simple, this one. Drop it on the ground. And it does damage every second. And it's area of effect. And the two morphs are quite simple. One of them increases the radius and the damage. So it's stronger and a wider area of space. The other one increases the duration. So it doesn't get the damage boost, it doesn't get the size boost, but it lasts for 15 seconds instead of 10. So for resource purposes or just 
personal choice. That's the difference between the two. If you activate this, it will put a massive circle of dead on the ground. Constant lightning damage. It comes with another bonus as well. Both versions come with this. If somebody takes the synergy from this that it applies, if they're standing on it or standing next to it, they will do shock damage and error of effect. Shock damage can apply minor vulnerability if you're lucky with concussion. That can go along other skills to apply off balance. We'll save that for another video, but basically it's very, very helpful and adds extra damage to the group. Critical Surge is one of the most important skills in the Sorcerer's Arsenal if you are looking for survival as a solo or group player. And I wouldn't recommend you leave home without it. But there is another variant of it, just in case. So to start off with, it's called Surge. You get Major Brutality and Major Sorcery while it is active for 33 seconds. And while active, dealing critical damage heals you for 2.8k every one second. So while that Lightning was on the ground, if you heal every second, or if you damage every second rather, you will heal in return. Now this changes the skill. The heal, instead of just healing you, now heals around you, but with a longer cooldown. So instead of healing every one second, you heal every three, and this can actually affect allies. So it becomes a group heal. You still get the benefit from the major sorcery and brutality, but it's a less potent ability for you personally, but does affect the group. Critical Surge, however, increases the healing. So the skill itself automatically heals you for 2.8K per crit, this now heals you for 3.6k per crit. Those numbers vary depending on the way that you are built, but it heals you once a second. All you have to do is crit damage. So the more things you stack up, obviously the more likely that is to happen. Don't leave home without it, it's insane. Bolt Escape, obviously taking advantage of the whole lightning theme, is your escape ability. So if you are in trouble, have some of this. My help if I press the right button. Gone. Goodbye. This does have a side effect, so don't do what I'm doing right now, because you'll run out. So, you dart ahead in front of yourself, obviously for 15 meters, and it has a 6 meter radius, which does actually stun anyone that is close by. So your escape also stuns them to give you more time. But, casting it again within the last 4 seconds of it being applied will make the next one cost 33% more. So if you spam it, you are in trouble. Now the two morphs for this, Streak now deals damage and stuns enemies, between your beginning and final location. So your charge stuns and hurts. And Ball of Lightning creates a Ball of Lightning that protects you from projectiles. So you no longer stun the enemies, but grants brief snare and immobilization immunity after casting. So you could be immobilized or stunned when you come out of it if someone catches you, but now you can't. And the Ball of Lightning created at your end point interrupts up to one projectile attack made against you every one second for three. So at the end of it, if you're being fired at, you will protect yourself against them with this ball. You fire it, ball lands, that is a protective circle. So instead of stunning the enemy, you get away and survive. Up to you which one you use. They're both very, very useful, obviously, depending on how you want to build. In a nutshell, it's the way to get away. Now we're going to go over ultimates real quick, and then we're going to go into the passive so these start lining up. Now there's one ultimate for each class skill line. They all have their own effects and some are for damage, some are for healing, some are for protective purposes, whichever. They've all got their own pluses and minuses. Negate magic is absolutely insane. This creates a bubble on the ground and it's the longest stun in the game. So basically for 12 seconds, this prevents the enemy from using magical abilities and enemies within the globe are stunned. Enemy players are silenced rather than stunned, so basically none of their skills work. And it looks like this. Big bubble, anyone inside that is basically screwed. Which is great. Very long duration stun. So if they've got no resources, they're not coming out of there for a long time. The two different variants are quite simple. This one does damage over time. Very high damage over time, in fact. Magic damage every one second, so the full 12 second duration there. And this one does the opposite. This actually heals. So both of them have a 12 second duration as far as the stun is concerned and as far as the silence is concerned. But one does damage and one heals your group. So if you're a healer, you might want this. If you're doing damage, you might want this. Either way, massive crowd control ability, very, very useful and quite cheap on the ulti side of things as well, with being under 200. Daedric Summoning, obviously to keep up with the theme, applies a pet, a rather large one in fact. This is a Storm Atro. This lands on the target and stuns them. So you've got two stuns, but this is a shorter duration one. And he will fight for you. Much like any other pet, it will hit the main target, obviously, that you're fighting or any other target that is close by. But if you heavy attack, it will change targets and hit the other ones for you. Now, this will do shock damage and stun enemies when it lands and then do lightning damage to 
its target, whichever one it picks, but it also has a synergy attached to it. The group can take advantage of a synergy that will give everyone Major Berserk for 10 seconds, increasing their damage done. That is a bit of a game changer, especially if you're going for a bit of a burn on some of the bosses. Now you've got two different variants. This one increases the health and damage of the Atronarch. So single target, more damage, lasts longer. This one has an air of effect attack, which always applies concussion. So concussion is a side effect of lightning. Basically, if it's inside a wall of elements that also happens to be lightning, it will guarantee off balance. Generally speaking, the concussion effect is to apply minor vulnerability. So every enemy hit by this takes more damage. So this one is your debuff version in air of effect. This one is your higher damage output version. And finally, storm calling. Overload, basically Palpatine. This turns your light attacks or heavy attacks into raw lightning. You will take advantage of the current amount of ultimate that you have, and it will cost per hit. So we activate this. Your heavy attacks do lightning damage in front of you. And as you can see there, I've actually built up my daggers at the same time. Light attacks, fire bolts of lightning. This does a big zap. There is two different morphs to this. One will actually increase the range of your light attacks and radius of your heavies and increase the damage. So it's much stronger. And this one will actually give you resources back, both magicka and stamina. So stronger or resource recovery. So this one can actually be utilized quite tactically. You can um, activate lights and heavies and just fill your bars up while doing damage. Whereas this one, just raw nuke. Now it will deplete your ultimate until you've run out unless you turn it off because you can reactivate the ability. And that is how they justify the cost. It's 21 ultimate per hit. So if you activate this, you may be able to see on my ulti bar here. Turn it on. You can still use your skills inside of it as well. So you can use these skills, you can block, you can do all that stuff, it still applies. But you've got bigger range, more damage, it's quite dramatic. 311 ultimate at the moment, watch it deplete. And again, each light attack will cost you 21. Each second of the heavy attack will cost you 21, and so on. Now we're gonna go into the passives and start lining these up a little bit. So first of all, in the dark magic skill line, you have a reduction to health, magicka, and stamina cost for your non-core combat abilities. That means anything that isn't a block, dodge, break free, sprint, etc., etc. This is for active skills, ones you actually put on your bar. When you hit an enemy with a directly applied dark magic ability, you heal for 3k. That actually escalates quite dramatically depending on your build, but it scales off of your maximum health. So any of these abilities that are applied, if they deal direct damage, and a couple of them do, you will heal from them. After blocking an attack, your next ability is cheaper, except for if it's an ultimate. So magicka, stamina, or health costing skills. And when you cast a dark magic ability of any kind, whether it hits a target or not, as long as you activate that skill and it did apply, then your group will get Minor Prophecy, which is a 6% critical chance bonus for spell crit rating specifically. It's a 20 second bonus, it's really easy to maintain, but this is what you bring to the group as a class. Daedric Summoning, of course, is all about pets and summoning stuff and things. If you reactivate a skill, the last one finished. If a pet dies or your shield runs out, then that counts as finished also. Any skill that is finished will give you resources back depending on its cost. If it was Magicka, you get Magicka back. If it was Stamina, you get Stamina back. It's your resource balancing skill. Ultimate abilities, no matter where they come from, are cheaper. Increases your health and Stamina recovery by 20% at all times while having a Daedric Summoning ability slotted. And increases your maximum health for the same rule, having one skill slotted at least. So any of these on your bar, as long as they're there, will give you these two bonuses and the other ones are with you all the time anyway. Bear in mind, just one skill is enough to get you the health and the recovery bonuses. You don't really want to leave home without it. Even if you're not using pets, even if you're not using bound armaments, it's nice to slot a damage shield to get that extra help. Storm calling, obviously loads of lightning, increases your magicka recovery. Bear in mind, obviously, the dark magic skills, we do actually have, if you're looking at crystal frags, we have sustainability built in because we get stuff back every time we fire, technically with it being your next skill is cheaper. We also have the recovery from the Daedric Summoning skill line, or you can slot Bound Armaments or Aegis in order to give yourself more resources. And then you've also got recovery on top. So these all stack together very, very nicely if you start mixing and matching your skills. This increases all physical and shock damage that you do Sorcerers excel at shock and physical damage. So obviously, if it is built that way, you can capitalize on that bonus. 
No one has anywhere near as much physical or shock damage as you, depending on how you spec, obviously, because you're the only one that gets it. Much like a Dragon Knight gets fire and poison bonuses. Increases your damage against enemies by 1% for every 10% concurrent health they have. This is where it gets tricky. I'm going to simplify this as much as I can. The higher the health, the more damage you do. The Sorcerer is very strong at upfront burst. So the pet that we had earlier, the Twilight, does more damage the higher the health. This passive gives you more damage the higher the health. The entrance to the fight is where you do the most. Now to counter this loss, so the lower the health, the less damage you do, we do have an execute that you can take advantage of to kind of close that gap. So you do less and less and less, and then you do more and more and more. It's a, it's a roller coaster ride as such. But bear in mind, while you add 100% health of the enemy's uh, health bar, do 10% more damage, every 10% you gradually do 1% less and less and less and less. But at 10% health, you're still doing 1% more damage than any other class with this skill. That's not to say other classes are weaker, that's to say that that is a bonus to you full out. So even at low health, you're still doing more than you would without the passive. And you increase your weapon to spell damage for every sorcerer ability slotted. Technically speaking, you can actually make that 12% if you put six skills, including your ultimate, but it's a benefit nonetheless. So, lightning, physical, pets, and control is what the sorcerer is all about. You are fast, you have the ability to control people with prisons and stuns, you have really good resource management, you've got traps, lightning, and pets. So now we're going to go over a couple of sets that I would recommend you look into when it comes to actual gameplay style. If you want to kind of work on your class identity, I'm going to go over the healy stuff, the tanky stuff and the DPS -y stuff. So for you tanks out there, if you want to make sure that you're doing loads of lightning stuff, you want to feel like a storm, then of course you've got stuff like this. You've got live wire. Basically you get hit and you overload your circuits, burst with lightning, heal from it, and apply concussion in area of effect. That means that while your Atronarch may not be present right now, you can still provide concussion all the time. Sure, there's lots of different sets in the game, you can do whatever you want, but this one is actually very, very fun and effective on a Sorcerer if you wanted to take advantage of that. Now, when you're talking DPS, obviously DPS, you want to maybe consider the fact that lightning or physical is your strength. So if you're a magicka build, you might want to take advantage of a lightning staff because you'll get more damage from it. And of course, if you're a stamina build, you might want to take advantage of some physical weapons, maybe a bow, a two-hander or dual wield. The choice is essentially up to you, but you will benefit from the basic passives that they provide and you will also enhance them based on your own class. So if you have anything that is poison, fire or magic, you won't actually get an increase or anything like that. But if it says physical or lightning, then you will. Now, DPS set wise, we've got a lot here. We could go into clockwork and we can take advantage of another pet and lightning at the same time because you actually summon a robotic velociraptor here that does shock damage and knocks everybody down like they're bowling pins. That's a really fun set. The Mad Tinkerer That's also from Clockwork City alongside the Livewire set. So you could go to the same zone and look for tank stuff and DPS stuff. It's entirely up to you. Now, if you go to Coral Irie, there's a monster set in there, which when you deal damage with a heavy attack, you create a whirlwind that moves around and does shock damage and physical damage at the same time. People inside of this circle actually benefit from this and get resources back or reduction to cost even, but you also do damage in the meantime. So you just heavy attack, big wind goes out, great. You can take advantage of your passives. Now, if you go into the base game stuff, you're looking at a Lambris, the monster set from uh, Crypt of Hearts 1. Yes, it's got fire on it, but you feel like a proper wizard. You've got fire and lightning coming out at the same time. You're basically creating storms. It's very, very fun. It's effective, and you do feel quite powerful as a sorcerer. Going into Tempest Island, you've got a couple in here. You, uh, In fact, you've got three. You've got the Overwhelming Surge, which constantly zaps lightning in front of you if you do damage with a class ability, which is easy for us. Just fire some mines or an execute, and it will constantly fire. You get magic back. You do damage. Everybody's happy. You've got Jolting Arms here. Again, if you were going more tanky, we'll go back a bit there because we did go into the tank stuff a minute ago. But when you block, you charge your arms up and your physical and spell resistance is actually higher and your bash attacks deal extra damage. So theme-wise, that feels quite fun when you've got that kind of energy build up from Lightning. And of course, you've got Stormfist. Technically speaking, Tempest Island is a sorcerer dungeon. You could just stack this all on a sorcerer and have fun. You will do shock damage with a big fist that comes out of the ground and physical damage at the same time. Win-win. 
in the DLC stuff again, you've got so many different options, but there's a rather cool one in Coral Ari for healers. If you overheal yourself or a group member with a direct heal, so that could be the pets, the clan fear, or the budgie, for the next six seconds, that individual, you or them, has a buff to them, dealing 33% of the overall amount of the overheal to enemies around them for once a second in seven meters for 10 seconds. So if you overheal someone to the point where you can maximize that hit for 3.3k, every second is going to do 3.3k air of effect damage. So you basically turn somebody into a bomb. It's not a massive amount of deeps, but it's definitely very, very fun to look at. And the lightning is cool. Now, generally speaking, you've got lots of sets in the game that do lightning damage or physical damage. You could capitalize on them if you really wanted to. There's over 600 sets in the game. We could be here for a long time. But those are the things that you could look for if you wanted to basically push your build towards a theme and take advantage of its base passives. At the same time, you've also got other benefits you can take advantage of, including your glyphs. Remember, you do more physical damage. You do more shock damage, so it makes sense to utilize those if they make sense to your build. So basically, in a nutshell, the Sorcerer benefits from pets, from buffs and bonuses towards resource management, and of course, flat damage output towards lightning and physical. So if you want to be a wicked lightning wizard or a physical whirlwind of death, then you can be. But you can also be incredibly tanky and you can also be very, very effective as a healer. But you need to know which skills to use to take advantage of that. So when it comes to heals, you're mostly limited to uh, individual heals or close quarter, slow ticking AoEs. So you might want to take advantage of some weapon skill line stuff. When it comes to DPS, you've got a massive arsenal of stuff. But again, your weapon choice is entirely up to you. So you can stack them up against each other and see what works for you. When it comes to the tanky stuff, you pretty much got everything. Big resistance bonuses in the Stormcalling skill line. You've got big heals from the... Daedric summoning skill line, and you've also got lots of crowd control in the dark magic skill line. It depends on what you want to mix and match. So if you are looking to make your own build, you're obviously in the right place because now hopefully you understand the skills, but if you're looking for a pre-made build that already exists, there's the Lazy Sork up there on the left-hand side. There's the Bobby build on the right-hand side. Both of those are one bar builds, one DPS, one tank. There are loads and loads of builds on the channel. And of course, I live stream every night on Twitch. So if you want to catch up the live streams and ask questions about this kind of stuff, feel free to drop in. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Don't forget to sub and bye bye.